Can someone truly be redeemed after committing one of the most heinous crimes? Friends, colleagues, and students of Professor James St. James say absolutely. Before he was a university professor, at 15 years old, he murdered a family of three in their home. But the jury found him not guilty by reason of insanity. After this, he faded into obscurity and changed his life for the better. But many don't look at it as simple as this. Was James truly suffering from delusions, or was he a master manipulator who used his intelligence to get away with cold-blooded murder? Welcome to 10 Minute Murder, brief and bingeable true crime. My name is Joe, I'm the host, and thank you for joining today. And yes, I do realize that this is coming a day later than I normally release episodes. Usually I would have released this yesterday. Um, but I just found out that Florida Georgia line broke up, and I've been dealing with that, so, so that's my excuse. Also, I've got work stuff going on, but it's mostly the Florida Georgia line thing. Hey, if you're brand new to listening to 10 Minute Murder, first of all, I'm super excited that you're here. Please subscribe wherever you're listening right now. There are like a million places, not literally a million, but there are a bunch of places you could be listening. And wherever that happens to be, I hope that you like the podcast. I hope that you subscribe and continue to listen and binge some of the back episodes. There are over 200 of them, almost uh, almost 250 by now. And when you become a subscriber, you don't miss any episodes. You get them as soon as they're released. They download and boom, right there, ready for you to listen to. You can also connect with 10 Minute Murder on social media. All the social media platforms you can connect on and how to contact me personally, you can find at 10minutemurder.com. Okay, now let's get to the story today. James St. James was born James Gordon Walcott in 1952 and lived with his family in the small Texas town of Georgetown. James was described as being incredibly intelligent with an IQ of 134. His parents were Gordon and Elizabeth Walcott, and he also had a sister, also named Elizabeth, Libby for short. His father was a biology professor at the local Southwestern University, and his mother was outgoing and active in the church. Libby was just 17 years old at the time and was predicted to be her class's valedictorian. They were all a well-known and respected family of four in their large white-framed house. So on August 5, 1967, when 15-year-old James Walcott ran out into the street at 4.30 a.m. claiming that someone had murdered his family, the community of just 5,000 were stunned. The boy directed the police to his home where his sister and father both lay dead and his mother was fighting for her life. James initially made up a story about an intruder in their home, but he quickly confessed to being the actual killer himself. The murder shocked Georgetown, but the revelation of who killed them was even more astounding. James may have been a good student at school, but he was also a troubled young boy. He began frequently sniffing glue and reported hating his family. His father didn't allow him to be involved in the anti-Vietnam War and peace movement of the late 1960s, and this upset James. He tried on several occasions, but his father forbade him from attending the rallies and marches. Although this is not a reason for murder, it is what James confessed. As for killing his mother, he calmly stated that he was tired of her loud chewing. And Libby? Well, she just had what he called a bad accident. He claimed that he was so annoyed with his family and felt as if they were, quote, conniving against him to drive him out of his mind. He planned for weeks to murder his family and later reported that he was suicidal as well. On August 4th, the night of the annihilation, James and his sister returned home from a concert. James then sniffed glue to give him a boost and loaded up his 22 caliber rifle. He then waited until midnight to begin his carnage. James first went into the living room and shot his father twice in the chest. Then he headed to Libby's room, where he shot her once in the head and once in the chest. Lastly, he shot his mother three times in the head and chest in her bedroom. Both Gordon and Libby Walcott died instantly, but his mother was fighting for her life. James hid the rifle in their attic and ran into the street screaming that someone had murdered his family, and he kept yelling, how could this happen? 
When the police first arrived, they quickly declared the father and sister dead and took Elizabeth Walcott to the hospital. However, she died shortly after arriving. After being questioned, James finally confessed to being the annihilator, told them where to find the murder weapon, and was placed in the Williamson County Jail. Multiple psychiatrists were asked to examine James's life and the murders. There didn't seem to be any sort of abuse in the home, but James told each one that he hated his family. He admitted to being annoyed by his mother's loud chewing, his sister's accent, and his father's rules. Although he did not have a history of mental illness, the psychiatrist concluded that James suffered from paranoid schizophrenia, but that he was also mentally competent to stand trial. In 1968, James was the first juvenile to be tried as an adult in Williamson County. During the very brief trial, the defense attorney, Will McLean, was claiming he suffered from delusions of persecution at the time of the murders. After a very short discussion, the all-male jury handed James the verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity. He was then taken under the care of psychiatrists at the Rusk State Hospital in Nacogdoches, Texas. In 1974, just seven years after the murders, James was deemed sane and released at the age of 22 years old. He was able to inherit his parents' estate for being the only living relative and also received his father's monthly stipend from his university pension fund. After being released, he changed his name from James Walcott to James St. James and pursued a career in academics just like his father. He graduated with a master's degree and then a doctorate in psychology. He was quickly able to join the faculty of Millican University, a small private institution in Decatur, Illinois. According to friends and colleagues, Professor James St. James did exceptionally well at the university. He was well-liked and popular among the staff and students, and throughout the years, he rose in the ranks. He received a tenure, several academic awards, and became the head of the Behavioral Sciences Department. As for his personal life, he never married or started a family of his own. James succeeded in his career and seemed to have come far from the murderous young boy that he was. But his past didn't stay buried as he had hoped. In 2013, a Texas journalist published an article unearthing James's horrifying past. The state's actions were predictable. Mayor Mike McElroy urged him to resign, and other officials asked the school to put him on leave until it could be investigated. But Millican University stood beside James, and he emerged from his exposure as a hero. Students and faculty all viewed him as a man who suffered great mental illness and was able to miraculously turn his life around. He was praised on campus and in the community. Several Millican alumni spoke about James, and they all had kind words. Hollywood actress Heather Burris even shared her experience. Quote, I know him as a warm and thoughtful person who was a friend as well as a fantastic teacher. Even cooked meals for me when I was broke one summer and really needed a decent meal. That was my experience of the man, end quote. As of 2021, 69-year-old James St. James was still listed on staff at Millican University's website, but it's unclear if he's still a professor there. James may have turned over a new leaf, but many don't believe the psychiatrist's evaluations and the jury's decision in 1968. Johns Hopkins medical researchers performed a small study that suggested schizophrenia is very often misdiagnosed and it was likely much worse in the late 1960s. Furthering from this, many question how James only suffered one delusional schizophrenic episode. It's unclear whether or not he took medication after he was released from the hospital, but he seems to have been cured of the incurable schizophrenia disorder. Nevertheless, James has declined all interviews, so we'll likely never know if James was really insane or just using his superior intelligence and IQ of 134 to get away with cold-blooded murder. That's today's 10-minute murder, brief and bingeable true crime. Thank you for listening to the story today. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, if you are not yet a subscriber of 10-Minute Murder, I'll wait for you to do that right now. That's enough time. That's, that's how long it takes. If you subscribe to this podcast, you will never miss another episode. They will always be right there waiting for you when you are ready to listen to 10-Minute Murder. And for more of a 10-Minute Murder experience, you can connect with the podcast on social media. Links are in the show notes of this episode, or you can just go to 10minutemurder.com, find them there. And even easier than all of that, type it into the search bar of any place that you're trying to follow 10 Minute Murder, and it's going to pop right up. If you have friends, family, coworkers, you think that they could be into brief stories of true crime like this one, 
let them know about it. Uber drivers, if you're Uber driver, you think they may be into it, uh, let them know about it as well. And one of my favorite Uber drivers, Johnny, recently reached out to me and let me know that he was listening on his daily journey around the city that he lives in. And I really appreciate that. Thank you for listening to 10 Minute Murder. Be safe and make good choices.